a man came to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi and he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, tell me something about Islam that I will need to ask no one after you about it. Meaning, give me a complete answer about Islam. What is Islam? How do I practice Islam? How do I become or remain true to Islam and steadfast upon this, this path? The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, قُلْ آمَنْتُ بِاللَّهِ ثُمَّ اسْتَقِمْ Say, I have believed in Allah and then remain steadfast. Follow the straight path. That's what you do. Remain steadfast upon the straight path. Very simple. Very straightforward. Regardless of the level of education, everyone can understand this and can practice this. And this was the path of the Prophet ﷺ. The whole Qur'an, if you recite the Qur'an, what the Qur'an says about Islam, it is this style, it is this approach that every human being can really understand and relate to. And this is what the philosophers who seek complexity later on, they started looking down upon. They started saying, these are very simplistic answers. We need something more sophisticated, more educated. And they thought that when you bring sophistry or complexity to, the, to issues of faith, they, they thought that you raise these issues, you elevate them. But the reality was, you're just raising walls between people and the realities of faith. Because faith is the most natural thing. Believing in Allah, worshipping Allah is the most natural thing that humans can ever experience. It's the very nature of humans. This is the creation upon which Allah designed humans. There will be no change to the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why if humans are left without external influence and they are left to the purity of their hearts to choose and Islam is placed in front of them in its pristine nature, humans follow it naturally. They, they gravitate to it. Their health, their well-being is in it. Their sense of self is in it. It's natural. A man came to the Prophet ﷺ and it seems this man was getting old and his mental capacity was, being lim was limited. So he came to the Prophet ﷺ and he complains. He says, Ya Rasulullah, inna sha'a'ira al-Islami qad kathurat alayya fadullani ala amrin atamassaku bihi jama'ah. He says, O oh, Messenger of Allah, these legislations, practices, rituals in Islam that I'm supposed to learn and practice and do are getting a little bit overwhelming for me. So guide me to something that is central something that is pivotal in Islam, that I hold on to, and it would be sufficient for me. فَقَالَ عَلَيْهِ الصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ لَا يَزَالُ لِسَانُكَ رَطْبًا مِنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Let your tongue remain moist and fresh with the remembrance of Allah. If you do that, you will find you are already practicing Islam. Because if you look at the Salah, it's one of the highest forms of dhikr. Reciting Quran is one of the most profound ways of dhikr. And all of the acts of worship seek to bring you to be conscious and aware of Allah all the time. So pretty much the Prophet ﷺ guided him to the probably most straightforward, the easiest in terms of practice. But it will draw him into Islam and it will help him remember all of the other things. And this is how the companions radiallahu anhum, this is how they taught Islam to others. And this is how the scholars of Islam who remained upon the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, when they called people to Islam, their way was very straightforward. There was no complications. There was no philosophy. There was no sociology and terminology classifications when they communicated Islam to people. Because Islam is meant to address people even in their most simple level of thinking or level of education. Uh, and any kind of complexity that we find in our heritage, in, in Islam, is meant for the sake of advancing you know, the study of Islam for specialized students. It's, it's meant for academia. For academia. Just for those who want to be advanced, those who want to master the sciences of Islam and be able to address the newly arising conditions. They want to capture the heart of Islam and be able to distill from it the applications and the manifestations. But that's not, for, that's not necessary for someone who just wants to worship Allah. 
someone who just wants to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be devout, when they face an issue, they ask a person of knowledge. But if we do away with all of this simple, straightforward, natural approach to Islam, and we want to make everything complicated, sophisticated, then we are actually erecting or we are placing barriers between people and the practice of Islam. And what we are witnessing now among Muslim populations in the East and the West is that we are not setting our priorities right. What does a Muslim need in Islam? Jibreel alayhi salam came to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the form of a man and he caught the attention of the companions because of the freshness of his looks. He wasn't from Medina, but he came in, in the most beautiful, clean clothes as if he just came out of his house. But he was a stranger. He came to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he was in the midst of his companions. He, spe- he sits right next to him. He places his knees against the knees of the Prophet sallallahu And he says, tell me about Islam. What is Islam? The Prophet ﷺ simply shares with him Islam and tashhad an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammadan Rasulullah wa tuqim al salah wa tuqti al zakah wa tasum al Ramadan wa tahujj al bayta in istata ilahi sabila. The five pillars of Islam: the shahada, salah, zakah, the fasting, and the hajj pilgrimage. He said, "Sadaqt, we told the truth." For akhbarni an al iman, the Prophet ﷺ says, "Al iman an tu'mina billahi." وملائكته وكتبه ورسله واليوم الآخر والقدر خيره وشره that you believe in Allah his revelations his angels the messengers and you believe in the day of judgment and you believe in the qadr of Allah the pre decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the good whether it manifests in your experience as bad or good you know everything is the creation of Allah everything is written by Allah decided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so he's in full control he said, Sadaqt, you're telling the truth. He said, Akhbirni an al ihsan, highest level of practicing Islam and doing your best. What does that mean? The Prophet said, An ta'bud Allah ka anna ka tarah, fa in lam takun tarahu, fa inna hu yarak. That you worship Allah as if you actually see Him. So your experience, your awareness, your consciousness of Allah is so present and strong is to the point that you are experiencing all your life as if you are literally seeing Allah with your eyes. So Allah is so present in your life as if you are seeing Him with your own eyes. But you see Him with your heart. All the time you are aware of Allah in your heart. So Allah is so present in your life experience. And that changes everything. That's the one thing that changes everything. فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاكَ And if you are unable to reach that level, then nothing less than being always mindful that Allah watches you, that He watches you. So it's a lower level of consciousness, but still very high. Then He asked them about the signs of the nearness of the Day of Judgment. Very simple, very straightforward. And that's what every Muslim should learn about Islam and practice. As simple as that. But the thing is, you find Muslims talking about issues of a siyasa shari'iyah. Muslims who don't know how to make wudu' properly, who don't know how to pray, who don't know even how to recite Qur'an, who don't know even the meanings of the Fatiha or the adhkar they perform in Salah. And then they are talking about issues of policy in Islam, public affairs of Islam, how politics should be done in Islam. Then they talk about rulers and leaders. Then they talk about scholars and their fatawa, and this scholar is wrong and this scholar is right. Then they start talking about the reality of, for example, Ya'juj and Ma'juj, and are they real or not? Then we start listening to all of these speakers who everyone is coming based on their whims and desires and their personal experience. Some people are saying, you know, Dajjal is, such a, is, is, the, is the TV or the internet, and Ya'juj and Ma'juj are the Chinese. And, and so everyone is coming up with a new trend. And Muslims are debating that. Muslims even who don't pray the five daily prayers are debating that. Children, Muslim children, instead of learning Quran, are debating about this. The priorities are 
are reversed now. What does a Muslim need in this life? What, is, what are our priorities? That's what the Prophet ﷺ taught us. What are your obligations? To establish your tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You recognize Allah, you know Him. And then you seek to spend your life worshipping Him in devotion, love, obedience, fear of Allah. You, you humble yourself before Allah. You remain aware of Allah, you fulfill the obligations He placed upon you. What are they? Simple. Simple. The pillars of Islam. Then the Prophet ﷺ says in the hadith, Al-Halal ubayyin wal haram ubayyin. Allah made the halal clear. Everyone can see that for the most part. What is haram is clear. Everyone knows that zina is haram. Everyone knows that alcohol is haram. Everyone knows that theft is haram. Everyone knows that backbiting is haram. Everyone knows that, that stealing is haram. Everyone knows that envy and jealousy is haram. We know that. Just abstain from it. As simple as that. Then whatever capacity Allah places you in, in your, in your lifetime, fulfill that. You're a father, you're a mother, you are an employee or an employer, any capacity. Just be honest, be sincere and fulfill your obligations. Learn your Qur'an, learn to recite your Qur'an. Pray your prayers. If you have extra time, you have extra effort, memorize more Qur'an, learn its meanings. You have a bit more energy, stand up in prayer at night. You don't need to watch videos of people debating about issues. That's not your place. And it doesn't bring you closer to Allah. And any layman, you cannot solve a discussion that has been running for a thousand years among Muslim scholars. Do you think you are Allah's gift to the world who's going to solve this problem once and for all? That's shaitan playing with you. Why to take you away from the priorities so that when the moment of death comes, you look back and you, you realize you've wasted your time. You've been speaking about Islam without knowledge. Wallahi, these discussions that are taking place among the dua, all of these are secondary issues. None of them really help a Muslim come closer to Allah. They are s serving these people, these individuals, themselves. That's it. It's just bringing more attention to these people, to these speakers. But how is this serving a Muslim be a good Muslim? How is this thing serving a Muslim bringing them closer to Allah? Growing their love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How is that doing it? It's not. It's actually taking their attention away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, he explains the verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَكِنْ كُونُوا رَبَّانِيِّينَ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تُعَلِّمُونَ الْكِتَابَ وَبِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَدْرُسُونَ Be Rabbaniyin, be people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because of, or based on what you were taught from the book of Allah. So he said, Rabbaniyun means الَّذِينَ يُعَلِّمُونَ النَّاسَ صِغَارَ الْعِلْمِ قَبْلَ كِبَارِهِ Those who teach people the basics, the foundations of knowledge, before they take them to the complex issues, to the big issues. But the thing is, everyone wants to, get into, wants to prove their point, and they want to rally behind them as many followers and supporters as possible, even if this means distracting these people from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the worship of humans. This is, the, this is putting humans before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكِرِ We have made the Qur'an easy for those who seek to remember, those who seek to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Islam is straightforward and easy for them. Learn your tawheed, the rights of Allah to be worshipped. Learn about the beauty of His names and attributes. You don't need to get technical or academic about this. Just learn what merciful means, what just means, what forgiving means. Learn what almighty, powerful, omnipotent means and live by these meanings. You don't need to get into linguistic definitions and religious definitions and this scholar said this and that scholar said that and this person agreed with this and the other one disagreed with that and you waste your time. The companions, radiallahu anhum, their knowledge hardly consisted of any arguments. Hardly consisted of any arguments or discussions. It was very straightforward, very simple, very easy at a very intuitive human level and that made them the best generation. 
it made them the best generation. Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyallahu anhu, he said, الْعِلْمُ نُقْطَ كَثَّرَهَا الْجَاهِلُونَ Knowledge is just a dot. This is how big knowledge is simple. But it was magnified, it was expanded by the nonsense of the ignorant speaking about knowledge. So now, discussions are being produced and counter-discussions are being reproduced and reproduced. And now when you study something, there's a huge body of discussion. What is knowledge out of this body of discussion and arguments? Probably less than 2%. That's beneficial knowledge. 80, 98% is just complete nonsense, personal issues. So we should be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should be mindful of our priorities. Your religion, set, set the priorities right. Set the priorities right. Be like the Bedouin who came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, Ya Rasulullah, ma alay, O Messenger of Allah, what is upon me in Islam? What, is, what does Allah want from me? The Prophet ﷺ told him the same things. Tashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa tuqeem as-salah wa tu'ti al-zakah wa tasum ramadan wa tuhajjah wa tuhajjah al-bayt. The five pillars of Islam. He said, is there anything upon me more than that? The Prophet ﷺ said, la illa an tatawwa'a. There's nothing, is there anything more? He said, no, nothing, unless you want to volunteer. The man said, Wallahi la azidu ala dhalika abadan. I'm not going to do more than that. That's it for me. I'm going to just take the bare minimum and I'm going to, you know, like break even when it comes to what I give Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the man walks away. The Prophet looks at him and he says to the companions around, Aflaha in sadaq. He will be successful if he remains loyal to his commitment. Simple as, why do we make it complicated? Why do we drag people into unnecessary discussions that require years and years and years of training and it's more of a luxury? It's a luxury, it's intellectual luxury, talking about discussing all these things and then this group said this, this group said that, then dragging Muslims and speaking in the khutbah about political issues that require scholars who have profound knowledge in a siyasa shari'a, Islamic leadership, how to handle major issues that face the ummah as a whole, that have severe and huge implications. Then get Muslims, try to rally as many Muslims to back you up for personal support. Now that means we are using Islam for our own personal benefit. We're using the, the trust that Allah gave us to serve us rather than us being servants in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the midst of all of this, we waste the lives of Muslims. Anyone who's in a position of leadership or in any public position, in any capacity where they have some kind of influence over the Muslim population, they have a huge responsibility to put the, put the people first, put the religious welfare of people first, before anything, anything else, before any consideration. Because this whole experience in life is about establishing the truth. It is Allah who sent his messenger with the truth, with the religion of truth, so that it gets established. People get the right to know it. To know the truth and have the fair opportunity to and chance to practice it and follow the truth and save them save themselves. That's why Allah sent prophets and messengers. Not to create a reputation, not to become someone a memorable personality in the Muslim history, not to become someone that po people point to as a scholar or an exceptional kind of learned person. And the Prophet ﷺ warned against this. The Messenger ﷺ says, Man talab al ilma. A person who seeks knowledge so that they start arguing with these argumentative people. Or they establish themselves in the arguments among the scholars. They build a tradition, my tradition as a scholar. My legacy as a scholar. Or so that people hold them in, in high esteem or point at, the, at them and how exceptional they are, how intelligent they are in their knowledge. And that they came up with something no one else came, came up with. 
Then the Prophet ﷺ said, let these people be sure of their spot in the hellfire. Why? Because you are using one of the most noble acts of worship that is meant to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to serve the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're using it to serve yourself. So you, in a sense, you are placing yourself as a god. And that's a serious violation in intention. No one of us is free of that, by the way. No one. But we should always strive against this human tendency to draw the attention to ourselves, to see ourselves the center of this world. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروه. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد. These are topics I personally don't like to talk about these things, but it it really aches the heart not because we are good or better than others, but it just it just hurts the iman of any believer to see what's going on with the Muslims. And we have, you know, Muslim speakers and Muslim public figures are debating everyone, whatever someone says or does, someone else is critiquing them and some, then someone else is coming with weird, weird opinions and they're trying to draw attention and pull people behind them. And it's all become about personalities. And Islam is lost in the middle of all of this. And then when you look at who is fueling the fire, who is the fuel of the fire, it's Muslim laymen. Average Muslims. Average Muslims getting into trying to support this personality against that personality. And you see, it's fanaticism. It's fanaticism. It is support and worship of personalities. And we are all falling into this. And unfortunately, these personalities are adding fuel to the fire. And imagine just the Muslim layman did not get involved in these debates and discussions. They let these personalities fight among themselves. Let them fight among themselves. Wallahi, it would die out in a day or two. It's just like a, the virus. You know, the virus, if you are not carrying the virus and you're not mixing with people, this COVID-19, we are the fuel of it. We are the carriers of it. If we practice social distancing, we stay at home, we wear our masks, we take the necessary measures, we would not become the carriers or the fuel of this that is spreading it to others and people are, are dying out of it. The same thing, all of these discussions. If Muslim laymen do not think, oh, I'm, I'm going to defend this person or this personality or that sheikh or this sheikh or this scholar or that da'ya, if you just remain silent, let them fight among them, themselves. Because you have no share in that. There is no religious benefit for you in that. Even if you quote the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, whoever defends it, the honor of a Muslim, etc., that's a misimplementation. And you probably need to look at what is called hadd nafs in this. What is, what, are you, what is the payoff you're getting for, from this? Is this truly for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is it truly? Did you really inspect it properly before you get involved in it? And you would see, it, because you, the intention is not pure, the action will not pure. The action will be wrong. No, it's my fanaticism, it's my love of this scholar that is actually causing me to defend. So where is Allah here? Nothing for Allah here. And then we call this Islam, we call this defending Muslims, we call this defending the da'wah, and what we are doing, we are actually making it worse. The companions, radiallahu anhum, whenever they were asked a fatwa, everyone would pass it on to the other. No one would speak. These are companions of the Prophet ﷺ, they're knowledgeable. Whenever there was an issue, they would try to pull away from it. They didn't want to get involved. Because the most important thing is, was, is to, was to keep, or has always been, to keep your heart safe. Not get involved. Any fitna that does not come to you and force itself on you, do not seek it. Do not seek it. Because you don't know. No one has safety. And the Prophet ﷺ told the Muslims, even when it comes to the battlefield, because some Muslims wanted shahada. They were, they were, they were dying for shahada. And the Prophet ﷺ says, لا تتمنوا لقاء العدو. Do not seek, do not wish for meeting your enemies. Although it's such a high st status, but the Prophet ﷺ was teaching them what the priorities are. Preserve your assets, your original capital. Preserve that. It's better than any prophet you seek. Because once you stretch out, reach out to a prophet, 
you are placing yourself in a position of vulnerability. You're just like attacking someone with a jab, your defense, you have no defense. Your body is open for a counterattack. Same thing applies once you reach out to something. So the Prophet ﷺ said, لا تتمنوا لقاء العدو ولكن إذا لقيتموهم فاصبروا Do not seek, do not wish to meet them. But if you happen to meet them, it becomes a reality. Now be firm and patient. If the fitna, if the question, if the discussion does not force itself on you and you have no other choice, then remain silent. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu with the huge dispute that happened among the companions radiallahu anhum at the time of Ali ibn Abi Talib al Muawiyah radiallahu anhum ajma'een. He said, I'm not going to take part in the fitna. I'm not going to take part in this. And he took for himself a sword of wood. And he used to advise his students, he said, Kun Abdullah al Maktul, wala takun Abdullah al Qatil. He said, be the one who's killed and not the killer. Not the killer. Someone wants to kill you, don't kill them. Be the one who's killed. Why? Because you don't want to win your dunya and lose your akhirah. So let's set our priorities right. Learn your tawheed, learn your salah, learn your fasting, learn your zakah, whether you're in a position to give zakah or not. When you are able to do hajj, do hajj, learn as much as possible of the Qur'an. Every Muslim, that's what you need. When other speakers start discussing historical issues, issues, of, issues about signs of the hour, what that means, and interpretations, and they elaborate, and they bring opinions and philosophies and discussions, that doesn't concern you and doesn't benefit you, and this is not knowledge that is beneficial to you. This is a trial. You don't need to watch that. And resist the curiosity. Hold on, you hardly have enough time to learn what will help save you from the hellfire. Help purify your heart and bring you closer to Allah. Focus on this and let these people, you know, defame one another. But don't be part of this. Don't waste your religion. Don't waste your heart. Don't risk your iman and faith. Don't do that. And you will see on the day of judgment that that would be the best decision. Any other involvement, when the realities of intentions become exposed, you'd realize that it could not be a pure intention that would get you into discussions and debates like this that don't bring you closer to Allah in the least.